Welcome to the Clinical Update Podcast, the podcast that brings you thought-provoking clinical education from MEMS Learning that you can fit into your busy life. I'm Sangeeta Krishnan, Medical Editor at MEMS Learning, and today I want to talk about something that's a bread and butter condition for GPs, thyroid disorders. About 1 in 20 people has some kind of thyroid disorder. This topic's been on my mind because ever since I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism, I've since encountered so many people with thyroid disorders, ranging from Hashimoto's, hyperthyroidism, and even thyroid cancer. It's no surprise why this little butterfly-shaped gland is of so much clinical importance. Joining me in the studio today are my colleagues. I'm Rhiannon Nashman, And I'm Dawn Liz Powell. Sangeeta, um, you said you've recently been diagnosed with hypothyroidism. Would you be happy to share with us a bit about what your symptoms were and, and how it was for you getting that diagnosis? Yeah, absolutely. So when I found out in the weeks leading up to my diagnosis with hypothyroidism, I started to feel uh, really exhausted and I was constantly doing a lot of exercise. But initially I put it down to the exercise, but then I found that the exhaustion was disproportionate to how much exercise I was doing. So it didn't compute. At the same time, I was putting on a lot of weight. And again, that didn't add up to the amount of food I was eating. I was eating the same as I always did. but And I was exercising more, if anything. And in, instead of losing weight or keeping the same weight, which I would normally have done, I started to put on weight, which didn't make sense. And another thing, interestingly, is I all, I used to do Wim Hof, the whole fatty cold showers. But after a while, I stopped being able to do them and I don't understand why. I just couldn't tolerate the cold anymore. And I didn't realize at the time that it was because of the hypothyroidism. But now reading the symptoms, I, I realize that's what it was. So that's one of the symptoms of, uh, you know, when you don't have as good tolerance to cold as you would normally have. So generally what hypothyroidism does is it slows down your metabolism. It's associated with a slower heart rate, tiredness, feeling cold, weight gain, puffy eyes and skin, and heavy periods. So these are the classic symptoms of hypothyroidism. So did you have a family history of hypothyroidism? Yeah, and that's the other funny thing, because I didn't know that until I got diagnosed. Later on, found out my dad's been hypothyroid for a long time, and he's he's on uh, levothyroxine. So apparently it's in the genetics as well. So that's hypothyroidism then. And um, the opposite side of the coin would be hyperthyroidism, which would speed up the metabolism and is associated with tachycardia, sensitivity to heat, feeling anxious, nervous or ir- irritable and amenorrhea or irregularity in the menstrual cycle. Just going back to hypothyroidism, I was like listening to you explain what symptoms you were having and what the classical symptoms of hypothyroidism are. But to be honest, they all sound kind of vague. So I think if somebody's experiencing those symptoms, they might be thinking it could be all sorts of things. Anything could be wrong. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I think if I'd have been experiencing those symptoms, Sangeeta, I'd have potentially been feeling quite anxious about it because the symptoms of thyroid disease obviously can be very similar to signs of other conditions, as you said, Dawn, making it difficult to know exactly what's causing them. So is it worth us considering then which people might be at higher risk of developing thyroid disease than others? Yeah, it definitely is because even though the symptoms are really non-specific, they do point, they can point to hyperthyroidism because the prevalence of Thyroid disorders is greater in women than in men. And those assigned female at birth are five to eight times more likely to have a thyroid condition than those assigned male at birth. Those with a family history, those who are older than 60 years of age, and those with Turner syndrome are also at a higher risk. People with certain autoimmune conditions are also at an increased risk. And there there are certain drugs like lithium and amiodarone, which can also cause hypothyroidism. I just want to point out that if thyroid disease is suspected, given that a significant proportion of thyroid disease is autoimmune, it's reasonable to consider other autoimmune conditions that may contribute to symptoms. For example, you have celiac disease, Addison's disease, or pernicious anemia. Other nutritional deficiencies should also be considered, like vitamin D and iron deficiencies, as should menopause, sleep apnea, post-viral chronic fatigue, 
and mood disturbances. Okay, so hyperthyroidism is when there's something wrong with the thyroid. But as a refresher, how does the thyroid actually work? So I'm sure our listeners already know this. The thyroid is controlled by the pituitary, which produces TSH. And this instructs the thyroid gland to release T4 and T3. There's more of T4 and less of T3. And both circulate and enter the cell, but only T3 is the active hormone. And this is what moves into the nucleus and the thyroid hormone receptor, and it does the work. And the work, by the work, I mean it controls the body's metabolic rate, heart and digestive functions, muscle control, brain development and function, and the maintenance of bone. Uh, T4 is more like a storage hormone, so it's converted into T3 as and when needed. TSH is controlled by a negative feedback loop. So when there's high T4 and T3 in the blood, these switch off the production of TSH, which reduces the stimulation of the thyroid and the amount of T3 and T4 being made gets reduced. And if T3 and T4 go up, TSH goes down and vice versa. But when the thyroid is underactive, such as in hypothyroidism, there's not enough thyroid hormone, so it reduces pituitary inhibition, which makes tons of TSH. Yeah, in a webinar that we ran a couple of months ago on the diagnosis and treatment of hypothyroidism, Dr. Nicola Zamet drew a useful analogy saying that this is the equivalent of the pituitary shouting at the thyroid, asking it to produce more T4 and T3. I like the shouting at the thyroid analogy. It does make it easier to understand. So just in terms of diagnosing hyperthyroidism or hyperthyroidism, thyroid function tests are used to measure the level of T4 levels in the blood. We also have a webinar on hyperthyroidism, and that has lots of useful information on what the different results of thyroid function tests indicate. So I would recommend having a look at that webinar for more details. But in summary, low TSH with high FT4 suggests overt hyperthyroidism and the opposite result, high TSH and low FT4 suggests overt hypothyroidism. And if FT4 levels are normal, but TSH levels are high, it's subclinical hypothyroidism. If FT4 levels are normal, but TSH levels are low, it's subclinical hyperthyroidism. And in the rare cases where you see high TSH and high FT4 levels, you'd be thinking about a TSH secreting adenoma or thyroid hormone resistance. And if you have both low levels of TSH and FT4, then you'd be thinking about central hypothyroidism or non-thyroidal illness. I also wanted to add that the correct diagnosis is vital for successfully treating hypothyroidism. Like Dawn said, typically a TSH level of less than 10 milliunits per litre will indicate overt hypothyroidism in association with an FT4 below the lower limit of the local reference range. Thinking about the risk that people with subtly abnormal tests will develop overt hypothyroidism, less than 3% of people with an isolated raised TSH will develop overt hypothyroidism each year. And over a 20-year period of follow-up, only 33% will develop persistent hypothyroidism. So clinicians will consider other factors suggestive of an underlying thyroid disease before they decide whether or not to treat patients with subclinical hypothyroidism. Similarly, for hyperthyroidism, two consecutive TSH readings below 0.1 milliunits per liter or evidence of thyroid disease like positive antibodies or goiter will warrant treatment in subclinical cases of hyperthyroidism. So what do the NICE guidelines have to say on who should have a thyroid function test? So clinicians are familiar with testing thyroid function in those who've got the symptoms that we discussed earlier. And in a module that we've got on the NICE guidelines on thyroid disease, it says that NICE also recommends testing in people with unexplained low mood or anxiety, and also in young people or children with growth abnormalities, change in behaviour or school performance. And there are three other interesting points in the NICE guidelines that I wanted to flag up. Uh, firstly, menopausal symptoms can mimic symptoms of thyroid disease. So that's one to bear in mind. Secondly, you shouldn't investigate during acute illness unless you think that the acute illness is a result of the thyroid dysfunction itself. And third, you shouldn't assess thyroid function automatically for all of those with type 2 diabetes. So checking thyroid function in people with type 2 diabetes 
and during acute illness is current practice in some areas, but the evidence showed that type 2 diabetes isn't associated with thyroid dysfunction. So the committee for the NICE guidelines concluded that thyroid function tests shouldn't be performed just because they've got, just because somebody has type 2 diabetes. I would say, though, that NICE does state that thyroid function should be assessed in people with type 1 diabetes. Right, so we've talked about diagnosing hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism um, and when to suspect these conditions, but what about management? How should they be managed? A recent consensus statement issued by the British Thyroid Association and the British Thyroid Foundation says that leothyronine should only be initiated by an NHS consultant endocrinologist for hypothyroidism. Additionally, it should only be prescribed if no alternative intervention for the patient is available. For some patients with confirmed overt hypothyroidism and persistent symptoms who've had adequate treatment with levothyroxine and in whom other comorbidities have been excluded, the consensus statement suggests that a trial of leothyronine levothyroxine combined therapy may be warranted. This was discussed during the hypothyroidism webinar and the consensus statement was issued to address the uncertainty surrounding the use of leothyronine. And I believe for the for GPs, the advice is to audit the number of patients on leothyronine prescribed for thyroid disorders. This should be minimal in terms of numbers of patients and this should be evidence of advice by endocrinology available, for example, a letter justifying its reason for use. Yeah, because the same consensus statement recommends repeating thyroid function tests to ensure they remain abnormal before thyroid hormone replacement is initiated. Studies have shown that thyroid function could resolve spontaneously after stopping thyroid hormone replacement in about 12% of patients with overt hypothyroidism and in about 35% of people with subclinical hypothyroidism, implying that a substantial proportion of people with abnormal thyroid function tests may not need LT4, and giving these individuals levothyroxine will not lead to an improvement of their symptoms. For hyperthyroidism, Management hasn't changed a lot, but as a recap, those with hyperthyroidism awaiting specialist review may be managed with antithyroid medication and supportive treatment, and when prescribing carbimazole, clinicians should consider MHRA advice on contraception and the risk of acute pancreatitis. First-line treatment for hyperthyroidism includes radioactive iodine, hypothyroid drugs, and surgery. And on the topic of hyperthyroidism, Excess thyroid hormone can lead to thyroid toxicosis too. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so when the levels of thyroid hormone become inappropriately high due to any reason, it's called thyrotoxicosis. Graves' disease is the most common cause, followed by nodular thyroid disease. It can also be induced by certain drugs such as amiodarone, interferon, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, highly active antiretroviral therapies, immune checkpoint mediators, and monoclonal antibodies. There can be viral or bacterial infections that trigger thyrotoxicosis too. The NICE guidelines on thyrotoxicosis also says that transient thyrotoxicosis without hyperthyroidism may only need symptomatic treatment such as with beta blockers. So we've considered the systemic symptoms of thyroid disorders, but Dawn, what about if someone presents with a neck lump or a swelling? Well, first of all, neck lumps or swellings are a common presentation in primary care. In fact, about 15% of the UK population have clinically detectable neck swellings or thyroid nodules. NICE states that a swelling or nodule, whether it's palpable or found incidentally on imaging, could be malignant. And therefore, patients presenting with a thyroid swelling or nodule should be referred for an ultrasound. GPs may wish to use the suspected cancer pathway to refer. On the subject of thyroid nodules and lumps... I attended this interesting conference on the subject of thyroid cancer and I found that up to 40% of thyroid cancers have potentially targetable mutations. There's also the National Genomic Testing Service, which is delivered through a network of seven genomic laboratory hubs across the UK. Genomic tests available in England can be found on the National Genomic Test Directory. That's interesting. But just to note, if a swelling or nodule is not thought to be malignant after initial ultrasound, repeat ultrasound and T. SH measurement should be offered if symptoms worsen. For example, the patient becomes breathless or becomes hoarse. 
And if you'd like to learn more about this, you can sign up to a free live webinar that we're running on the 22nd of October this year, 2024, at 7 p.m. The webinar is running in association with the BTF and the BTA. And we'll hear from consultant endocrinologist Dr. Carla Moran and consultant ENT surgeon Mr. Ram Morthy on investigations and treatment options for thyroid nodules and goiters. You can find the link to sign up in the podcast notes. That was a lot of information on thyroid disorders. We've gone over hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism and malignant and benign nodules and goiter. So what were your key takeaways from today? My key takeaway is that thyrotoxicosis can be induced by certain drugs uh, such as amiodarone, interferon, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, highly active antiretroviral therapies, immune checkpoint mediators and monoclonal antibodies. And I was interested to read that as well as the usual symptoms of thyroid disorder, NICE recommends testing thyroid function in people with unexplained low mood or anxiety and also in young people or children with growth abnormalities, change in behaviour or school performance. Mine is that while thyroid function tests should be offered to children, young people and adults with type 1 diabetes, they should not be routinely offered to people with type 2 diabetes. Thanks, Dawn and Rhiannon, for joining me in this discussion. Thank you all for listening. Don't forget to sign up for the webinar on thyroid nodules and goiter. You will find links to this and other modules discussed in this episode in the description box. Tune in to next week's episode of the podcast where I will speak to Dr. Jay Naik about breast cancer, diagnosis, red flags and dealing with patients. See you next time.